Hello again and welcome to Tumagna. Leaders often face criticism. I'm sure all those heads of state who are currently meeting in Cornwall for the G7 summit know what it's like to be on the receiving end of negative press from different groups and organisations. Sometimes the criticism is justified and sometimes not. As we continue on our journey through Acts, we find Peter, the leader of the early church, facing criticism from a particular group within the church. They'd heard a rumour that he'd been socialising with non-Jews. Peter meets with them at a summit in Jerusalem to explain his actions. Let's hear what happens as we listen to John Bishop reading Acts chapter 11. The apostles and the believers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, you went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them. Starting from the beginning, Peter told them the whole story. I was in the city of Joppa praying and in a trance I saw a vision. I saw something like a large sheet being let down from heaven by its four corners and it came down to where I was. I looked into it and saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, reptiles and birds. Then I heard a voice telling me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. I replied, surely not, Lord. Nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my mouth. The voice spoke from heaven a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and then it was all pulled up to heaven again. Right then, three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea stopped at the house where I was staying. The Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with them. These six brothers also went with me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen an angel appear in his house and say, Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He will bring you a message through which you and all your household will be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us at the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord had said. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? When they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God, saying, So then, even to Gentiles God has granted repentance that leads to life. Now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word only among the Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. During this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, named Agabus, stood up and through the Spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. This happened during the reign of Claudius. The disciples, as each one was able, decided to provide help for the brothers and sisters living in Judea. This they did, sending their gift to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. Thank you, John. 
I became a Christian when I was 17, and since then I've been a member of seven churches. The first, where I grew up in central Scotland, two were in London, where I lived for five and a half years, three have been in Bristol, and now I've been a member of Nailsey Baptist Church for about 23 years. I've no idea how many churches and fellowships I visited, but they all had one thing in common. Not one of them was perfect. They all had problems of some sort or another to a greater or lesser extent. And if they didn't have problems, it was because they were spiritually dead. And I suppose you could say that must surely be the greatest of problems. The point is, life, growth, brings problems. You see it so clearly in the New Testament where nearly every letter was written to churches and individuals because there were problems. Problems of false teaching, immorality, lovelessness, rebellion, persecution, unbelief, and on and on it goes. I actually find that encouraging. Whatever your problems may be, and please don't tell me you don't have any, they're not new and you're not alone. I think sometimes we can be a little bit shy about being honest about these matters. We, we like to call our problems challenges because it makes it sound a bit more respectable. But what I love about the Bible is it calls a spade a spade and it doesn't sweep unpleasant, difficult things under the carpet. So here we have in chapter 11, the aftermath of a major act of God, which had the potential to tear apart the fledging church of Jesus Christ. But it didn't because of one thing, the grace of God in the hearts and minds of its leaders. You remember what happened in chapter 10, which is repeated almost verbatim in chapter 11. Peter starts to preach the gospel in the home of Cornelius, a Roman centurion and therefore a Gentile. And blow me down, but God breaks in and fills everyone there with the Holy Spirit. And word soon spreads that Gentiles have received the word of God. Gentiles whom the Jews for centuries wrongly believed, as it happens, were excluded from God's redemption plan. Now Peter has gone up to Jerusalem to give his first-hand account of this wonderful, fantastic, amazing events. Gentiles have come to faith and received the Holy Spirit. And what was the first reaction of those leaders in Jerusalem? Rejoicing, praising God, an enthusiastic welcome and embrace of Gentiles who now belong to the family of God and all the blessings that came with it? No, it was criticism. But, to be fair, the criticism wasn't from everyone. It was just from one particular, particular but highly influential group of Jews who had come to faith in Christ but were still hanging tenaciously to their law of circumcision. They were shocked. You, Peter, a Jew, you actually sat down and ate with Gentiles? How on earth could you do such a thing? Now, for those members of the so-called circumcision party, this was absolutely reprehensible. But do you notice, they weren't upset because he had told them about Jesus. It was the fact that he had sat with them, sharing a meal. Now that's significant because in that culture, Eating with others indicated total acceptance. It was saying, in effect, you are now one of us. Now, Jews did not eat with Gentiles. Segregation was something they were born into. It was a way of life, and it was so deeply entrenched that it would take a mighty miracle to make them change their minds. But there was more to it than that. They accepted that Gentiles could become followers of Christ as they had, but they were now saying that they also had virtually to become Jews, which meant the men being circumcised. This was a crisis which could have brought about a devastating split right at the start of the early church. And in fact, later on, when Paul started preaching that Gentile Christians didn't have to become Jews or be circumcised, he was savagely persecuted by his very own fellow Jews. Now, just to interject, there is an important principle here, and it's this, that wherever God is at work, there's always opposition, and nearly always that opposition is from within the church. 
There are fellowships and churches up and down the land where the Spirit of God is being resisted because people are unwilling to change and receive what God wants to give them. For years, in some places, God has been waiting to bring renewal, new life, fresh vision, revival. But the people, Christians like you and me, have said, no, thank you, Lord, we don't want to change. And you know, eventually, there comes a time when God says, that's enough. And the Spirit withdraws until hopefully they come to a place of repentance and turn back to God. There are churches in Bristol which were once beacons of light, full of the love and life of God, but they're now empty shells with maybe just a handful of mostly elderly folk who are doing their best to keep it going. They don't realise the Lord has long since departed. Some have closed down, including one I went to for many years. It no longer exists. If only they had learned from the experience of the early church, and in particular this incident. What could have become a disastrous split was prevented by one thing, grace. The grace of God that was clearly in Peter's heart as he very patiently gave a full account of what had happened in Joppa and then the home of Cornelius. And also the grace of God we see in verse 18, where we read that when they had heard Peter, they fell silent. They fell silent, including the circum circumcision party. They were stunned. The criticism evaporated, the anger subsided, as they recognized that this was all the glorious work of God. Everything that happened there was clearly his doing. And then they rejoiced. They rejoiced because they saw that God had granted salvation to the Gentiles, from whom up until then they had maintained a religious aloofness. Their change of heart was surely the grace of God at work. What blessing we miss when we resist and quench the Holy Spirit. But what blessing we receive when we open our hearts to whatever He wants to do among us. And for you and me today, we have the enormous advantage of having the Word of God to guide us and keep us from getting entangled in error. Because there have been lots of so-called works of the Spirit, which, which, have been, uh, which have turned out to be nothing of the sort. One of the things I love and respect about Chew Magna Baptist Church is the faithful preaching of God's Word. So long as it's followed and put into practice, I think it's a bit like uh, a divine form of domestos, which kills 99% of all known germs of error and false teaching, and how much we need that these days. So we move on to verse nine, 19 and persecution. It began with the murderous stoning of Stephen, you remember. Paul was there giving his approval and even holding the cloaks, cloaks of those who were killing Stephen. Many believers were fleeing from Jerusalem because of persecution. And they spread north to Phoenicia, where Lebanon is today, and up the coast to Antioch and across to Cyprus. So you'd expect that, or having already experienced persecution for following Jesus, they would now want to keep their mouths shut. But far from it, they couldn't keep their mouths shut as they kept speaking the word, as verse 19 puts it. Now, they weren't standing on street corners preaching loudly the word of God. The word Luke uses is laleo in the Greek. I think, I've no idea if that's the way to pronounce it, but it's spelled L-A-L-E-O, laleo, I think, which means chatting talking. It means even whispering. They were, in effect, gossiping the gospel. It was as though the Word of God had broken free, no longer restricted to being just around in Jerusalem. And God was using persecution to spread it far and wide. At first, it was being gossiped only to the Jews. But in verse 20, we read of some converts from Cyprus and Cyrene who had arrived in Antioch and were telling their new Greek neighbors about Jesus. And glory be, many of them believed. And so eventually news of this great happening got back to the church leaders in Jerusalem. And so they decided to send Barnabas up to Antioch to find, to find out what was happening. And what he found there thrilled his heart as he saw how God was blessing these Gentile converts 
who very soon would be nicknamed Christians, meaning Christ's ones. And do you notice what Luke wrote about Barnabas in verse 23? He encouraged them. He encouraged them. In fact, we know his name means son of encouragement. Such people are surely worth their weight in gold. Every church fellowship, every pastor, every missionary needs to have a Barnabas, someone who has been anointed with this so essential gift of encouragement. And how much we need such gifted people, especially in these days when apathy and indifference and lack of hunger for the things of God and preoccupation with the things of the world seem to be the order of the day among the Lord's people. All it takes is one Barnabas to inspire, excite, lift up and encourage us to keep going when the hills are steep and your legs are sore and you feel like giving up. God sends us all Barnabases and even God make us all Barnabases. We can learn to encourage one another. Let's do it. How wise the leaders were back in Jerusalem and sending Barnabas, a good man full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And in Barnabas, we see a great example of something else. He had the humility and the grace to recognize his limitations. He accepted that he could encourage these new Christians in Antioch only so much, because what they needed now was deeper teaching, someone who could open up the scriptures and get them well and truly grounded in the faith. Yes, Barnabas was a terrific encourager, but he wasn't a teacher. But he knew a man who was, and who happened to be living not very far away from Antioch in a city called Tarsus, and his name was Saul. And you know, it's very much because of Barnabas that we know about him and his work and his writings today. In Acts chapter 9, we read how the newly converted Paul, as he became, was being persecuted in Damascus for preaching that Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah. But he escaped and went to Jerusalem to join the disciples there. And here's, what's ha here's what happened, Acts 9, 26 and 27 tells us. And when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, and they were all afraid of him, for they didn't believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles, and the rest, as they say, is history. Barnabas never sought great things for himself. He was content to be an encourager in the background. He was happy to let others take the limelight. And this is so important in church life. Where there's rivalry and jealousy of those who have received gifts and callings from God that perhaps we secretly wanted, the blessing of God can become choked. There's little growth because the body of Christ has become crippled with spiritual arthritis. How much we need to know and recognize not only our own gifts and abilities that God has given every one of us, but we need to graciously recognize the gifts in our brothers and sisters and encourage them. And we also need to learn to be lovingly tactful when someone thinks they're good at something, but it's, painly, it's painfully obvious to everyone that they're not. It's not their gift. Sometimes to withhold encouragement is as needful as encouragement itself. We need to have those around us who not only recognize the gifts God has given us, but love is enough to say that the gifts we thought we had, we patently don't. And so to encourage them to find out what gifts God then has given them. We're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 that one of the most valuable gifts to the church is prophecy. It's a gift which God had given to a man called Agabus. And in verse 27, we read how he uh, forecast a widespread famine across the known world then. And as a result, the newly formed church in Antioch decided to send relief aid to their fellow believers down south in Judea. And Paul and Barnabas were chosen to deliver it. But right here, there's another key principle that's characteristic of a growing church, summed up in one word, giving, giving. The church which has learned to give grows. Many of you will know the story of Pippin Jay in central Bristol, 
when I came to Bristol in 1975, it was the church to go to, full of life, full of worshippers of all ages. It was the church everyone was talking about. And the reason? Well, a decade earlier in the 60s, it was on its last legs. Attendance had dropped to an all-time low, and the bishop was actually thinking of closing it down when it would have been turned into a potato factory. Imagine that. But it remained open thanks to a small, faithful group of praying members. But there was little growth, and closure was once again a possibility. But the then bishop decided to give it one more chance. And in 1974, he put uh, the Reverend Canon Malcolm Widdicombe in charge, and the bishop gave him a year to save the church. But under Malcolm's ministry, the church experienced renewal in the Holy Spirit, and there were encouraging signs of growth. Now, one of the first changes Canon Widdicombe introduced was a commitment to give 10%, a tithe of the church's income, to mission. Now, when you consider the costs of maintaining and running an ancient church building, apparently the oldest in Bristol, you can see what a huge step of faith that was. But they took that step, and in 1975, the church was thriving, to such an extent that uh, ITV in Bristol, HTV as it was called, produced a documentary about it. And in that documentary, Canon Widdicombe said he believed their honouring God with their tithing to missions was one of the reasons they were so blessed. And today, Pippin Jay is still thriving. What did Jesus say in Luke chapter 6 and verse 38? Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So let's not be stingy in our giving. It only leads to spiritual poverty. So I'm coming to a close now. Today, we've looked at three particular characteristics of a growing church. One, it's a church which is using the gifts God has given and rejoicing in each other's gifts. Two, it's a church which is willing to obey God even when it means change and leaving our comfort zone. Three, it's a church which loves giving, whether it's time or money. And above all, it's a church where the grace of God runs free. Let's pray. Father, we know your desire is to bless your people and to make us a blessing to all those around us. Move among us by your Spirit, Create in us hearts which are ready, willing, and eager to let you do among us whatever pleases you. Give us hearts which are willing to leave our comfort zone and follow you wherever you lead. Bless John and the leadership team. Encourage them, anoint them, guide them, inspire them, and manifest your presence among us so that everyone in Chew Valley will learn that you are here, ready to welcome all who seek you, and even those who don't. Amen. Thank you, Crawford. And now a closing blessing. May God the Father help us to live this day to the full, being true to him in every way. May Jesus the Son help us to give ourselves away to others, being kind to everyone we meet. May the Holy Spirit help us to love the lost, proclaiming Christ in all we do and say. And may God the Trinity bless us abundantly and bind us together in his love now and always. Amen. <laughs>